The Floor Academy podcast is sponsored by Trelama, the trade labor marketplace, where businesses can find skilled trade labor, such as flooring installers, and where flooring installers and other skilled tradespeople can find permanent or project work. You can set up your profile at trelama.com, T-R-A-L-A-M-A.com, or download the app from the Apple App Store or Google Play. And remember, Trelama is always free for skilled tradespeople. Welcome to the Floor Academy podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hedin, owner of Illustrious Hardwoods in Phoenix, Arizona. We are here to talk with flooring professionals from all across the country about the issues that matter to you. This week's guest is Leonard Hall. Lenny owns and operates Endurance Floor Company. After taking over from the previous owner, he scaled the company back from all flooring types to just hardwood sand and finish work. This led to find a way to niche into the custom high-end work like medallions, herringbone or parquet installs, and borders. Listen in as Lenny lets us know how we can find a niche for our business, but also how we can find and keep motivated employees for the journey. Lenny Hall, are you on the line? I am. Awesome. Welcome to the Floor Academy podcast. I I am super I feel super privileged to uh to have you on. You are a a name among names in the wood flooring world in my opinion. All right, stop now. <laughs> <laughs> I got a fangirl a little bit over here, you know. I get uh, I get to open on, up man. magazines and and see your name and and pictures oh, and yeah. NWFA what floor of the year awards you know that's you you've you've built something for yourself you've built yourself a name so that's uh i, I appreciate you taking the time to to come on to the podcast and uh grace us with your wisdom uh, no worries man it's, uh, it's not as much wisdom as just life experience <laughs> i guess that's <laughs> in the wisdom eventually but yeah uh, no i appreciate i appreciate the opportunity because um you know i one of the reasons why my name is always out there in magazines and in public doesn't want the notoriety is because frankly, uh, I have learned the hard way in my younger days. And if there's anything I can do to give back to the industry as a whole that treated me well is to try to shortcut that experience timeline for other people. So I, I donate a tremendous amount of my time, effort, energy, money, materials two NWFA classes uh, as uh, an instructor and, um, you know, I'm a writer. I, I, I uh, help technically edit the magazine uh, as an advisory committee on that. I'm on the board of directors. Uh, so I, I really put myself into the industry, uh, again, not for personal notoriety, but more to give back to what the industry has done for me. So if, if you want, I'll tell you how it all started. Reader's Digest version because I know it's a podcast. It's not like a you know, five-part miniseries. <clears throat> the um, year was uh, 1979. I was in high school in upstate New York. My parents wanted to move to Florida, so they did. But I concocted a, a, a scheme with my best friend. I lived at my best friend's house during high school. But I came down here in the summer, and my dad got a job at a Doris Floor Company where my dad and my uncle were working. And I would work there in the summers. 79 and 80 and 1981 uh went to college to have a double major in physics and mathematics i was gonna be a nuclear physicist and uh <laughs> ran out of money seriously ran out of money That's in my so sophomore funny. year it is yeah it's crazy right uh ran out of money in my sophomore year and i called my dad up and asked him if the owner of the company would hire me so i could earn money to go back to school so I worked a year and a half uh, from 80, the end, middle of 81 all the way to the end of 83 uh, at Endurance Floor Company, and I volunteered myself for every hour I could earn. Hey, Lenny, are you there? I go back to school. So I, you, I got to have you take so. it back a little bit. I'm sorry. Um just I, I know you're out there driving and you're working and I, I appreciate you doing what you're doing. So you cut out a little bit. So you were uh, you were you... um putting in every hour you could that they that they would give you so you could oh, get yeah. money. That's it. That's it. I decided I basically worked double shifts on jobs, sometimes worked straight through the night, went home, slept three hours, got up, did the same thing the next day. End result was 
the old man, the old man, the owner, Mr. Nub, wanted to retire, and he didn't want to give it to his two kids because he thought they would just run it into the ground. So he called me in one day and he said, uh, "I knew you're getting ready to go back to school, but I got this opportunity for you. The opportunity was if he, if I could pay the rent to his building through the company, he would give me the company over a period of a couple of years." So. Um, parents and I talked about it. We said, give it a shot. Worst case, you go back to school, do your thing. And, and I never looked back. Uh, that was 1984. And um, I've been the owner of Endurance Floor Company since 1984. And uh, so it's quite a long time ago. <laughs> but, uh, and, but, I, but we weren't good. We, I, our company was like any other floor company. We were mediocre at best. We had a lot of crews running around left, right, and center, making mistakes left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I wasn't involved in any of the uh, administrative side of it until after that meeting. And then I started looking at it. I'm like, why are we having Why are we hiring these guys if they're not going to be able to do the work right? Why are we? And I, said, I kept asking why, 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 like a two-year-old. And um, eventually, uh, Mr. Nupp allowed me to make some key changes in personnel, key changes in, in, in projects. Like we used to do everything but carpet. We used to do ceramic tile, vinyl tile, uh, commercial, industrial, um, hospitality, everything. And I told, man, over a period of four years, from 84 to 88, I convinced them to, let's tear the company down, let's specialize in only one thing, let's do wood floors, and then that point, even custom wood floors, and forget everything else. And he, at first, was very, very unwilling to want to do that, because he had built up decades of relationships with, you know, project managers for uh, hospitality companies and all that mm -hmm. stuff. But I told them, that, you know, we're, we're burning many man hours doing less profit margin on that stuff. Let's do the more higher profit margin stuff and only focus on that. Less people, less headaches, more money. You know, so anyway, that's how it all started. So by 1989, um, I was hand making my own medallions and borders, uh, putting them in people's houses. And I got written up in the Miami Herald about a major project I did. And then the freaking floodgates opened. And we, we got so much work and we're doing so many borders and medallions and inlays in a single year that I think most companies would see in decades of lifetime. Uh, it, was, it was crazy. It was, it was, uh, and of course, then you get uh, you know the notoriety. And then I, I was doing all that by myself. No formal training whatsoever other than reading books. There was no internet then. And trying it in my shop, failing Try it again, fail, try it again, fail, get it at the fifth, sixth time. Oh, we got this now. Now we can you know, do it in somebody's house and we don't you know, look like idiots. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how we did it. And so it, it took off because what I would do is I would practice in my shop making samples. Once I got the samples looking good enough that I thought, well, this I can sell, I would make sure that those samples went to every job site we were working on somewhere. Like if we were doing a sand and finish, I have a couple samples laying in the foyer that had nothing to do with that job, but they were just the inlays, the borders, the design work, the herring bones, whatever was going on uh, that my samples were. I would just have the guys take it to the job site. They'd sit there for four or five days. We're done with the job. They'd take them off. they put them on to the next job. And so people who would come see the work that the homeowner was doing, not because of us, they, you know, the friends want to come over. Hey, let's see, Jane. Let's see what you're doing in your kitchen. Let's see what you're doing over here. They'd walk past my samples and they'd see them. Yeah. And they would either ask my guys or they would call the office and ask them, you know, what the samples were. They were just telling them that we carry them in the trucks, but we don't like to keep them in the trucks. We like to keep them in the house because of the heat, humidity, and all that stuff. And frankly, just kept putting it in front of the people's eyes. And then the more people saw it, the more people would talk about it. And the more people would tell other people that they saw something cool and it was us that was doing it. And that's how the word of mouth thing spread out. Uh, well, By that's so smart. Yeah, by 1993, I stopped all print advertising complete because we had so much of the design work going on, we didn't need it. And all it was was just taking samples out and just leaving it in front of the people's eyes. Because you know, whoever's listening, you guys are all contractors. You all deal with architects, designers, builders. Then with a homeowner who's hired an architect, designer, or builder, they're bringing them to the house. They're bringing them to the project. They're doing work on the project, conversing with their their professionals. You got to take what you do the best and put it out there in front of them subtly. Like you don't want to just you, you never want to walk up on the door and knock on the door. Here, look, this is my sample. I can do this for you. No, that that just turns people off completely. But if you just leave it there, 
it becomes eye candy. You know, they walk past it in the foyer, the doorway of the garage, somewhere where they're going to go in and out of the house from. They see it, and eventually somebody is going to ask you. And then once you plant that seed, now you can start talking to them about it because they are the ones that introduced the thought of talking about it. They're interested. And that's how it all started. And I teach, I, I tell the story at all my NWFA classes because everybody always wants to know, how do I get out of the vanilla ice cream workout? doing i want to do something i want to do rocky road i want to do like sprinkles on top and the only way to do this you got to show people that you can do this you can talk all you want you can put all the uh, youtube videos and all sorts of stuff you want until people actually can see it touch it feel it they'll never appreciate what you can do interesting i you know i i love it you've got this story of you had a really great opportunity presented to you and you were able to have the smarts to look over the books at a young age and say, hey, this isn't right. We need to we need to find a way to get better numbers. So oh, yeah. you, you focus in on, on one thing and then you took it and you you presented people with, like you said, it's, it's a seed. You, you put it out there. And so you were able to make something, put it out and people see it and they see it and they see it. And they didn't want ho hum. They didn't want that straight lay. They didn't want to do a diagonal, and they they wanted to start doing something different. And they found the guy that can do it because you always had it in front of somebody. So yep. it's it it's cheap, free marketing. Oh yeah. And uh, it it just it it sits there and inspires people because they 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 see it all the time. So my question is is do you have like when if you go out and do a a bid. An estimate are do you bring like a portfolio book with you that you can show people before you even are getting the project and leaving these you know samples of fancier installs in their home and they can like flip through it even though they might call you up to do ho-hum but they can flip through and see this stuff yeah that that leads to uh the scenario of my earlier days um, we would we would get our sales calls, and depending on you know what what the call was all about, either we would go or not go. Uh, we never went on every incoming call because our focus was to do only true hardwood material. Uh, we didn't want to get involved with anything other than hardwood because remember we we're doing all these other product lines. So they were calling us for BCT. No, sorry, we don't do that anymore, sir. We're not doing that kind of work, and we would just tell people we weren't involved, and that gave us the time when the calls came in that we wanted to take the, the installation of a new wood floor, the refinish of an existing floor, uh, anything dealing with a real hardwood floor, we had the time and we weren't overly occupied on our schedule doing stuff that was not important to us. And so to get the people interested in this higher end stuff, yeah, at first it was uh, sample boards because we didn't really have much work actually physically done in the field. Uh, once we had a few of those, we took photographs of them and had them printed in some uh, form fam uh, pamphlet forms. I uh, would take them out because uh, we're talking days before email now. <laughs> today, today is uh, it's almost too simple. You go on to Google and you Google arcade pattern, boom. 10,000 sites of different parquet patterns from all around the world. Everybody in the world's done it. Laser cut, regular handmade, whatever. And you can have a client show you what they like that somebody else did. And you can either say, yes, I can do that. Or no, I know somebody who can make that for me. Then I can install it or whatever the case is. Okay. The, the communication is so easy now that we, we, like I said, stopped all printed matter advertising in 93. And, uh, don't have brochures, don't have handouts, don't have nothing that people want, anything of a design thing. We uh, ask them, what are they looking for? And then we can send them our private photo collection. And if that doesn't suit them enough, we tell them, Google something, send me what you want, and then I'll tell you what we can do about it. And that's really the simplest way to do it now. Uh, in that everybody has the same access to the same information. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you, if, you, if you looked at a, a site, you can send me the link. We're both on on our computers, I'm, I'm on the job site on my phone, you're at home on your computer, and I'm looking at the same thing you're looking at, and we're talking. As, as a matter of fact, this pandemic thing has just accentuated that form of communication because we haven't really wanted to go out and do estimates in people's houses, and people really don't want us in their houses. So I've actually had them FaceTime me 
on, in their house to look around the house while we're talking about their projects. Uh, and I could see certain things that I would want to see in person, but they're doing it for me. And so we were able to communicate with our clients and I'm using you know, modern technology stuff. So uh, new guys, because I, I, I follow a lot of people on and I, I'm on all these groups, and I see people ad, trying to advertise on uh, uh, pen, that's Pinterest. Is that I, I don't do it myself, so I'm not sure. You know, Angie's List, those kind of things. Yeah. And you know, frankly, I don't think that they're doing that company their service that they're expecting. The, the only way you can do it is do it yourself. And I would recommend them communicate with their uh, chamber, local chamber of commerce, get onto a couple of share sites that they can just keep putting out their stuff, and 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 go more proactive that way rather than depend on a commercial uh, advertising site. I, I'm with you. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of the, the pay for lead format um, that, no. you know, Angie's list or Yelp or any of that stuff is going to provide for you. I, uh, I personally use Facebook and then I go in like the local buy and sell groups and I'll, yeah. I'll put up like a weekly post, show off my work, talk about what happened on the project, how we overcame any issues, and and give me a call if, if you're interested. And it, it's worked pretty well. I'm not where I want to be, but it at least keeps a, a stream of, of work coming in as I build up a referral network. So how do yeah. we... You, you broke down a company and you built it back up. So let's... And, and you went into a very niche market. Now, a lot of guys that I, you know, I can see them talk on, um, Facebook and, and whatnot in these flooring groups. And they'll all say, Florida doesn't have any money. Nobody wants to pay. Nobody wants to pay. And here you are <laughs> doing like super niche work. So, and oh, yeah. it, it, that doesn't, you, you don't get a handmade custom parquet floor for $4 a square foot. It's not happening. So how do we, no. how do we break our company down <laughs> build it back up and charge these high end prices. All right. Well, um, several fronts to come to, to point out on that. First off, if you're running a company or if you own a company and you don't do any profit and loss uh, analysis on your work, then you don't know, like you don't really know where your strong points are and where your weak points are. You don't know if you're uh, spending uh, not enough time on one aspect of your business, whether it be sand and finish or installation, or if you're doing installations, are you doing every kind of installation out there because the phone's ringing? Uh, you know, if you're doing installations and you find out that, you know, you're better off doing jobs that are in the 300 to 800 square foot range because you're just a two man shop and handling a 5,000 foot job is just burning too many days on one job site that you don't get to get the you know turnover referrals back for. You can see that in your profit margin statements because you'll notice that your profit margins are maybe marginally higher on those mid sized jobs, they're lower on the small jobs, and they're lower on the huge jobs. And I know this because I've talked to too many people and have helped too many people in their own businesses and now and take an analysis of their of their company is that if you're if you're running a company and you, you can't make money on a really small job, number one is you're not charging enough money for this small job. You can't do the same type square foot rate work on a 100 foot job as you can on a 900 foot job. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you're trying to bid a three or four thousand foot job. And it's the, the number looks to you exceedingly large because it's a six figure job. You've never seen one that big before and you really want to get it. And you and you horse down the numbers so tight that your margins are non-existent. And then you do the job and a, and a big job like that every day, something's going to go awry. You're going to get sidetracked. You're going to get set a setback. You're going to have to, you know, maybe redo part of a room over again because I don't know, somebody nailed it wrong. Any number of things can happen that's going to have you come backwards a little bit. If you don't have enough margin on those jobs, you don't make enough money on those jobs, no matter how big the front number is. And so you got to look at your P&Ls on each, and every, in each job basis individually and find out which is the highest profit margin jobs that you're used to getting and you're used to doing and then focus only on those. And then if, with that information, you can analyze well, why isn't it that I didn't make money on that forty thousand dollar job? Well, because you know, even though you you figured out it was going to take you twenty buckets of glue, it actually took you twenty six buckets of glue because you have half open buckets that go bad. You have you know spread rates that aren't quite as what they what they were supposed to be. Maybe they're trying on them too thick, mm -hmm. and so you start to analyze 
why it is you're not making the money you should be making, you can adjust your pricing accordingly. And then don't be scared to ask for a big number as long as you know you can provide and exceed their expectations on that service. So that's where that's where and I tell people, look in look in your neighborhood. Look around your little town in, in Illinois or in, in the middle of Iowa City or anywhere. You tell me that there isn't a Porsche dealer, Mercedes dealer, an Audi dealer, or even like one of those guys that have Bentleys and, and, and Alston Martins. Mm-hmm. They're out there. Those companies, way smarter than a floor company, know where the money's at. They don't build a big dealership in the middle of nowhere that sells $150,000, $300,000 cars if they don't think that there's money there. <laughs> so my take is there's money everywhere. We're, we, we are surrounded by people in the most wealthiest country on the planet, and everybody has money. Some people like to flash it off. Some people keep it real quiet. But the fact is you should be able to make yourself a master craftsman of your trade and Ask for the money that you deserve to get paid for on your trade. Forget about what everybody else is doing. Get paid for what you need to be doing. I, and that's, I, how, yeah. that's how I go it. No, I totally agree. And I, I've used that that car dealership analogy on the on the podcast before because I don't care where you're at in the country. That premium car costs the same whether you're in the middle of you know, depressed Georgia or in LA, they don't charge less because you're somewhere else. So that you're, you're right. That money exists. Uh, so it sounds like you do work studies and you, you keep track of your guys hours and what they're doing and what kind of production they're getting and and all of that. So that's, you've got to know your numbers and that's been, we're going to preach that until the end of time on this show. Um, yeah. Are you still doing work studies? Do you you still go out and you look at the jobs and you measure, you know, hey, this guy's getting 200 square feet in a day and this guy does this much sanding a day? And are not you so, are, are so they much, always updating? Well, not so much uh, by production, because, again, the other thing that we did was get out of the production mentality mode. We're in a service mode and our job is to service the client with the best possible wood floor experience that they've ever had. <clears throat> so we don't. We don't press our guys to try to get two or three or four hundred feet in a day. Uh, regular pace of work would get them about, you know, say three hundred feet a day on a five-inch plank average. Okay. Uh, but we don't say if you don't do this, you're not doing well. No, we want them to make sure that they take the time, make sure they're not putting any boards in the floor that shouldn't be in there, whether they got a chip corner, split, uh, uh, an unsightly knot, or some kind of graining that's going to happen. That it's going to tell the owner to have us take the board out and put it again. Um, the analysis, though, is quite simple nowadays. We have an app on our phone that guys clock in and clock out of their timeline. The app is synced real time. It's in the cloud. So I can throw my laptop open and I can see where the guys are, what where they're working at. Uh, it doesn't give me square footage, but it tells me how many hours they did from start to end, mm-hmm. travel time, the whole thing. So uh, we did an, actually, we did an analysis the other day when uh, – for whatever reason, it was so obvious that this one crew was taking a little bit longer than what it should have been for the schedule because they were not one day behind a uh, predict, predicted schedule or four days behind. And as it started getting towards the end of the normal time and they're still saying they're not done yet, they're not done yet. I'm like, well, what's going on? And they would tell me that, well, they had to wait for the, the builders to get the guys out the scaffold out of the way and whatever whatever things were going on, yeah. it was happening in real real time. But, but I was showing them how this is impacting the company's profit margin and we were able to pull those reports right from this uh, app, uh, show them the, the time spent, the amount of hours it spent, the overhead it cost, and the amount, number of trips going back after the fact was adding to the cost of that job and taking away from the start of another job. And so, yeah, we do those. And, yes, each job is still p and l and they're, they're filed. But this just usually all falls in the same general range unless it's something out of whack. Uh, I'll bring it up to the guys and we'll talk about it. Because my shop was also a very open shop in that uh, there's nothing I hide. I tell them exactly what we charge for the clients, uh, for the jobs. They know how much they're getting paid. They know how much their pay rates are. They know how much everybody else's pay rates are in the company. Uh, nothing's hidden. And if somebody who's on the lower end of the pay scale wants to get on the higher end of the pay scale, the, the, the fact is simple. You have to develop yourself to be worth the money you want to be. And if you don't do that, don't expect to get higher pay rates. And we have every possible pathway for them to learn their trade. They can practice, of course, with the leader 
leaders to learn on the job. They go to NWFA's online university to at least get the basic information down. We also have huge 12 by 16 mock-up panels in my shop that they're more than willing to take the time and spend and practice on that either on the weekends or at nights or whenever they want to, or they have a you know time between jobs and go practice on that. But I challenge all my guys all the time, wake up and want to be better than you were the day before. And eventually you will become that better person, period. So oh, that's I, what we do here. That, the top. That, that's a very interesting approach because a lot of guys are going to say, don't talk about your pay. This is between you and I, blah, blah, blah. You don't need to know how much I make on jobs. So I think that's a very novel approach. And I, and I, you obviously have a very uh, it's clearly unusual. laid out um, plan. You know, some guy, well, some guys, some guys, don't, some new guys, like I, I'm constantly looking to hire people. And I've never had the same group of guys in all my 40 years, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the longest guy I have now has been with me 17 years. Um, the next longest guy has been with me 11 years. And everybody else is like less than five. Okay. Uh, sometimes they move out of town. Sometimes they, you know, go, go do something else. But here's the thing. I hire a new guy and I tell him straight up, I don't know what I'm going to pay you until you have some time in the company so I can determine where you are in the pay of pay of life. You know, are you good? Are you bad? Do you show up late? Uh, uh, do, do you like, you know, slack off all the time? Do you go outside and smoke cigarettes every 20 minutes? I don't know you yet. So we're going to work you five or six days. I'll determine a pay rate for you on that day. I said, you will get at least a base pay of 15 bucks an hour. Yeah. And then we're going to, then we're going to adjust that from day one based on what you show me over the next five or six days. And well, sometimes it's not 15, sometimes it's 18 bucks an hour. If I see by the second day, the guy's got something in his, between his ears and he's, you know, doing something, but I'll give him a pay rate and then we'll adjust it as time goes on. Well, I had this one guy who was griping about the fact that he was getting $16 an hour. And this other guy who he had an opinion of was also getting $16 an hour. Cause again, open, open thing. Everybody knows what everybody's making. Yeah. And he was, he was lamenting about this other guy. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. And, this, and, that. and I, I told him straight up, I said, look, you're worried about this other guy when you should be worried about you. I said, you got to be the one to determine what you get paid, not this other guy's actions. He's got his own problems. So you should be focused on you. Well, he kept going on. He's like one of those guys that just can't win unless he's making everybody else lose. Right. Yeah. So it, it, he only lasted two weeks and then boom, he was out. He could have developed to be a nice installer, but he had that personality trait that would not lend him to be a team player. And I didn't want him in the company, so out he goes. Yeah, well, that sounds like it's just going to become a cancer. He's going to, you know, that's going to nope. get into the other guys, and it's going to tear them down. So, but you also, I mean, you have, like you said, you have areas where they can go and and train. And so, do you have a system in place? Is there like, um, is it is it written out, or do you just say, ask questions, and this stuff is here and readily available? So if you want to progress, you can progress. Um, it's not written out in a formal book, uh, although I've been asked to write a book about the stuff we do as a, as a trade. Uh, it's usually situational uh, because if we're on a job site. Uh, we were on a job site last year for five months uh, in a house that uh, we were doing this uh, bespoke plank, uh, hand making every plank and, and ammonia fuming. So during the period of time, I had hired a couple of guys and I told them, I said, look, you're going to be doing this with these crews for months and months and months, you're probably not going to get the opportunity to understand what it's like to lay a herringbone, what it's like to do any because we're focusing on this huge house for the next couple of months. I said, but in due time, we'll get to it. And I would show them our training center, which is in our shop. It's a 12 by 16 panel. Um, and because I'm an NWFA uh, regional instructor, their mm -hmm. benefit is essentially they live an NWFA school every day that we work because we follow all the, we follow all the PPE guidelines. We follow all the NWFA installation guidelines um, and, and they learn it every day while they're doing the work. So that's the, that's the cool thing about them working in endurance is that they get the benefit of a NWFA class all the time, every time. And so eventually they'll all get to learn it. But, if it, but in, in any case, I did this one project two years ago it started and uh, out of a whim, we were between two jobs. And I, I'm sorry to sidetrack, but my mind is like a merry-go-round at 100 oh, miles good. an hour. And I, and, I, and I jump from one story to the next. But part of the reason why we have downtimes between jobs is because, again, we don't take every phone call. 
So uh, 2018, uh, we had a downtime between two job sites and two crew guys were kind of like at a loose end. I said, like, hey, let's do something cool. So we took open a part of our uh, office showroom area and we just started building uh, this medallion thing. It just started as, a, as a, just a sketch on a piece of paper. Let's do something you guys haven't done in a while. So we did this thing, then we added this to it, and then just keep just kept adding parts of like a Frankenstein kind of project. But it ended up being real cool in the end. Um, and so, but it, it spanned months and months of time because it was two or three days here, and then we would be off of it for you know a month and a half, then back on it for another day or two. Anybody who was not on a job or between a project, we would get onto that thing and just continue creating this. Uh, large inlay that was in our show, show showroom well, and uh, it gave people the opportunity to learn skills that they normally wouldn't have no and i think that's an interesting approach is you're keeping them busy you're letting them learn skills they're not normally going to get and i i think that's going to help them not only be more invested with you as as an employee in your company and feel like they're they're part of something bigger but it lets them work on skills that they don't normally get you know you, these guys my, myself included will will line up project after project after project after project and you go and you do the same thing in day in day out straight lay this put it down put put the home back together move on to the next thing and you're not having time to get that creativity in and so like you said you're not taking every phone call because you know exactly what you want to do at this point so how are you how are you pre-qualifying people and getting just those really niche projects you want so that you can um yeah obviously you're going to make better margins on it because it's it's custom and then you can you can afford to pay guys in in that downtime for two or three days yeah. to come in and work on stuff well i'm gonna i'm gonna answer that but let me finish out the downtime part because one of the aspects that you get as an owner is that one-on-one -on -one time with the guy you want to learn more about and also if you go away from the everyday vanilla work and you get into something that's outside the box for everybody you'll find out if that guy has the personality to do it or not because you can be nailing down two and a quarter strip five years straight with a guy and think he's the best thing since sliced bread who can he can rack out he can nail it, he can cut he can do all stuff mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you throw him onto a herring boat and the dude totally lost or he doesn't doesn't take the interest because in, herringbone on like strip has to be very precise and you have to be patient with it you can't force it to go faster than the product's going to allow you to put it down straight and clean yeah and so you learn think about think, things, doing these little project things in my shop give you an open eye opening to whether they're detail oriented do they have the patience to do that do they have the critical eye to see what it is they're doing not doing right uh can they learn from being uh, retrained. And so that way, like in this uh, medallion build out thing, right when we first started, within the first couple of days, the one guy that was uh, really, everybody loved him, helper, I found out that he does not have patience to deal with detail. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want to sit here and train a guy for two or three years to become a lead guy, only to find out that he can't do the stuff that we're known for. <laughs> yeah. Because he doesn't have the because he doesn't have patience. Not that he can't do it. He just don't want to take the time to do it. He wants to just rifle through all the work as quick as possible. Um, so anyway, so so he ended up leaving. Yeah, you know, we mutually agreed to like, you know, Chikari, this is not made for you, dude. We we got to find a way for you to get something else in your life, but it's not going to be here at endurance. You know, so yeah, those things tend to tend to work out when you work on one on one with somebody doing something that's not normal. You find out who the personality is you're you're working with. And so then that leads to how do you get these jobs to come to you? Go back to my sample days. Uh, people around our four counties, Monroe County, all the way up to Palm Beach County, now know, because it's been decades and decades of the same thing over and over again, know that Endurance Floor Company does these high-end projects. We don't get every one of them. And frankly, I don't want every one of them because mm -hmm. sometimes people these high-end projects but they don't have the budget for it or they're specifying it in a way that's not going to be complementary to the material or to us or to the owner when it's all done you know they'll, they'll schedule a project and they'll have us you know want to do this you know massive chevron pattern and they'll and i'm trying to think of a great scenario this one chevron pattern came out and we told us that this is not going to look right because you're building the chevron too big for the space 
and it's going to look chalky and blocky when you start going down hallways and whatnot. It needs to be smaller scale. And they didn't want to change it. I said, well, then I don't want to do your floor. And I yeah. didn't do the, do the job. You know? um, on the other side of it, we spend, I think, 70% of our time doing bread and butter work, which is your standard every day, go in a house, sand stain and finish it, uh, go in a house, do a remodel extension of an existing floor, sand and finish the whole floor. And we, we approach each and every one of those jobs as we're doing our high-end jobs. They get the same treatment. We do the same job site prep ahead of time. We do the same thing with all our, our job sites. We treat every customer the same, no matter whether it's a $5,000 customer or a $50,000 customer or a $150,000 customer. Everybody gets treated the same way. All our jobs are treated the same way. And so we don't have an issue with, uh, are we going to do level A work, level B work? I've seen that in social media. You know, Some guys are like, well, I'll charge X number of dollars if I'm going to do like the super, super clean top stand and finish work. And I'll charge a lower number if I'm going to do, you know, just like, you know, 36, 80 buff and coat. Here's the thing. And I'm not saying everybody has to work like this. And I, it works for everybody. But I decided a long time ago that I wasn't going to be the guy that gave people the options of what it is they wanted in their house. What they want is a great floor done by a great company. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't get involved with finish conversations, stain conversations other than color. They don't know what brand I use. They don't know what 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 product I'm buying. They just know at the end the nurse company is going to do that special walnut stain satin finish coated floor. It's going to look exactly like the sample, and it's going to be to the standards that they're expecting our company to do. Period. That's it. So I don't have to worry about three tier pricing or all this other nonsense stuff because I feel that if you are as good as you can possibly be in your area, you can charge the highest price possible, get the work done, and you don't have to worry about carrying 19 different finished brands or worrying about buying this sandpaper versus that sandpaper or do I do I not do that third buff over the floor because I can't afford it? No, it doesn't exist because we charge enough that if one of the guys, and this happened actually to us last week, we were going to stain a floor on Friday. They called me up at 3 o'clock and said, Lenny, this floor's not ready to stain. I still see scratches in the floor. we got to hold off to Monday. No problem. I call the owner up, tell her what's going on. She's like, oh, well, thank you for that call. We're glad you're not rushing the job. I said, no, if there's one thing we don't do, we don't rush anything. Mm -hmm. I said, we'll, we'll stain it on Monday, and then we'll let it dry a couple days. We'll put the top coats on uh, Thursday and Friday, which is, by the way, while I'm driving in a car, I'm helping one of my guys do the top coat on this job that we uh, stained on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. But see, you're still getting out in the field. You're still working with them. You're, you're keeping those relationships that you, you're building with them so that you know what they're doing. I, I like that. Uh, I find it interesting that you, you've you set it up to be this. This is what we offer. We're just going to be high end. We're going to do it right. We're not going to screw it up. But there, there's no option. So if somebody comes to you and they tell you that you they, they want an oil based finish, are you turning that down, or is it you know uh, is it is it your way or the highway, or is it you're you're open well, to options, but you're not going to give them five options when you bid the job? Yeah, in a conversation like that, a potential client calls up and says, you know, I'm going to do a floor in my house, or I want to extend. A floor, right? They'll be more apropos to the comment you made. If I want to extend a floor in my Florida room that used to be ceramic tile, now I want to put wood floor in there, but I want to match the rest of the house. Well, if the house from the 1980s has, um, you know, oil modified urethane on it, and it's yellow as a school bus, I can't walk in there and say, I'm going to be putting down three coats of water base in this back room. It's not even going to look close to the same. Mm -hmm. But I explained to the owner what it is that we're going to be doing how smelly it is, how we prefer not to have to work with it, but we are going to to match the rest of their house in this type of finished material. And uh, and then we go for it. Of course, the guys are wearing, you know, full on respirators, the whole thing. Uh, but we often are working with uh, more green finishes, whether it be the uh, European oil finishes or the water based finishes that are a little more user friendly, low VOC to no VOC stuff. Uh, because, you know, frankly, I used to be in the moisture cured era. That's where I grew up in this trade in the 80s. And I can tell you, walking out of a house coding with the lead guy uh, as an apprentice and sitting in my car for half an hour trying to come back to Earth before I could drive away, because we weren't wearing respirators back then. Yeah. Nobody thought about that stuff. You know, I'm killing my brain cells as I'm doing this work. And so, you know, we're now we're strong into dust containment, PPE, the whole thing. And the guys, you know, rarely ever have to deal with any of those harsher 
products, uh, but they still do come along because, like I said, we're we got uh, uh, many many years in the area. If we got to do a, a, a recode or an extension of an existing floor that had moisture cured on it, then we're calling up the supplier and get us four, four gallons of moisture cured. You know, we got to do this floor, but they're very far and few between. Thankfully, they don't happen that often. Okay. Um. So where do we? If someone's gonna start now i mean you said like back in the day you were putting the samples out and things like that so if somebody wants to start trying to move into like a more niche market now how do you think they would need to go about it uh yeah they, they definitely need to practice it first uh don't practice inside somebody's house for the first time uh the last thing you want to do is try it inside somebody's paying job have it go south on you and not have that reputation of knowing what you're doing. Because, you know, frankly, it's really all we have in our life is our reputation. And that goes back to patient do you want? Do you want to have the reputation of the guy that does two and a quarter natural color floor finish all the time? Or do you want to do more marketing stuff? You know, I just heard uh, about a company, uh, because I don't really look commercial work that much, but this company out of Tennessee, Prater Flooring, they do all the MBA and, and, uh, uh, Big Ten and all these college basketball courts. They do okay. the courts. They do all the the, the, the the logos and all the stuff on the courts. They niche themselves into that so well that they're, they're like the company. Hello? Oh, we might have lost them, guys. Hold on. I'm going to give it a second. Before, nope, we lo- there we go. See, I lost him. All right, let's call him back. There we go. Are hey. we connected? Yep, lost you. So, all right, so they, they niche themselves right into the, uh, like, best of the best yeah. for, for uh, sport yeah, courts. So, yeah, sport court logos. I mean, they do all those painted logos, and, I mean, they're, like, the best at it. And so here's a company that did that in the commercial side of things. They did that in the, in the sports side of things. That they were able to market themselves so niched and so top of their game that they're the go-to company. In, in your area, you can do the same thing with uh, just being on time. Most people are amazed that if you show up within 10 minutes of the time you said you were going. <laughs> <No, laughs> it, it's it's you, true. You know, we tell clients we're there between because, you know, metro traffic you don't know who's smashing cars and know what we are driving but we have told people over the many many years that we get a 20 minute window to arrive at your house between nine and nine oh. and the guys arrive between nine and nine twenty sometimes they arrive at eight fifty, and the people are like amazed that we're actually there early and uh, if you do that consistently and i, I can't say we do it every time because sometimes we get stuck in traffic we get sidetracked but the thing we do is if we know we aren't going to make it before we're late they're calling me or sending me a text. I'm calling the client and I'm advising, hey, Mr. Feldman, the crew is stuck in traffic. They're not going to make it until like another 45 minutes. Just want to let you know we're coming. We're just not there yet. And they're grateful for the phone call. That's yeah. the other thing. So if you want to niche yourself, start with the customer service experience first. They got to know that you are giving them the best possible experience of whatever it is that you want to be known for in your area, whether it's the natural sand and finish company or if you want to do remodeling, or if you want to do restoration, sport floors, whatever it is you do, start with the customer service aspect, because chances are that's the one thing that's going to distinguish you from everybody else, because the people who do the best customer service, starting with the phone call to everything else after that, is going to win the game in the long run. And um, and I've never had somebody yell at me because I called them to tell them we were running late, or they were going to be not staining a floor, or yell at me because we're going to be two days behind because this floor needs the work done to make it sure it comes out the best. Nobody's ever complained to me that we're running late because of that. Definitely. I've heard people complain about other companies. I call these people. They don't call me back. Uh, You know, they did my floors. I asked them to come out and take a look at something. They, They don't answer their phone. And that's how I get the phone call because people are frustrated with whoever did their job didn't give them any customer service after the fact and now they're hunting around and they call and they call and they call and they hear my name and they call me up and like, can you help me out and you know the thing i tell them i said well i didn't do your floor but i'll come take a look and see what your problem is 
and I'll advise you what you can do with it from there. Yeah. Well, sometimes I don't even do the work. I just tell them, you know, I'm not going to touch this floor because you got bigger problems than just this top coating you're talking about. Your floor is moving up and down. It's not nailed properly. It's not glued in properly. You got hollow spots everywhere, and I'm not touching it. Mm -hmm. And they're like really freaking out. And I've had people tear out floors and put them back in at their expense, paying me to do it when I have identified all the miscues that the previous installer or finisher has done on the job. Uh, once I can identify all that, they realize that they unfortunately selected an inferior company the first time around and they pick us for the second one. Yeah. And then they're, 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 they're our clients forever. I mean, we, we get so many referral calls. That's why I stopped doing all the print advertising. We get too many referrals. We can't handle it half the time. I mean, that's that's a topic for a whole different way to run a business and what you want to do with it and how to grow um, at between, you know, you can keep yeah. taking the referrals and, and keep doing print advertisement or billboards or radio online, whatever you want to do. You know, you would have room to grow a company. It's a decision of how big do you want to be. But like I said, that's a discussion yeah. for a whole other time. Uh, the communication thing is, is I think you're 100 percent correct in that contractors get a bad rap because i don't know at least 70 percent of them suck at communication showing up on time doing if you go to someone's house and you do what you say you're going to do you will impress them more than anybody else that comes through so like you said if you, if you tell them you're going to be there at 9 a.m to 9 10 a.m to to start the project Make sure it happens. If you're going to be late, communicate. Tell them you're running behind and, you know, there was an accident. Oh, yeah. and I'm, you know, like anything you do in that aspect, hey, I'm running behind. We don't like the way this looks. You know, I, I personally, I start off the day when the homeowners are there and I say, this is where I'm looking to get on the project. By the end of the day, I, I would love to be here, but realistically, I'm, I may be here. And, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, I'm communicating, hey, this is what happened. And this is where I want to get to tomorrow. And then I'll start the next day off the same, the same way. Um, if yeah. they're not there, I, I shoot them a text. Hey, this is what happened. If you have questions when you get home, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. Um, I had to go and I sadly installed the transition wrong. And uh, I didn't wait down one side on, on my floating floor. And I spent yep. 45 minutes driving out there this morning for a five minute fix and 45 minutes home. But uh, you know, it happens to us all. It, it happens to us all. Correct. We make mistakes. We make dumb decisions. Was there a way to fix it beforehand? Yeah, I could have used a piece of tape. So two minutes would have saved me an hour and 45. But, you know, we got to learn the hard way sometimes. So, But I was out there. I was able to take a picture when I was done, send it to the homeowner, and say, hey, it's fixed. Sorry for the inconvenience. If anything else comes up, let me know. And she was, you know, super Perfect. thankful because it was communicated that it was done. I didn't just tell her I'd be out there on Friday and take care of it. I, I went out on Friday, like I said, I took care of it. I sent pictures that, hey, I'm actually here. I did it. And now if anything else comes up, let me know. So those little things are what will build you those relationships, those referrals that you're looking for, in my opinion. And I think that's that's what you're saying is the little things yeah. are what actually matter. It's not the fact that you install better than anybody else. You just take more time than most. Yeah. And the, the high-end clients appreciate that even more so because they're used to being serviced. That's what they're, that's their whole thing is that they, they are higher-end clients. So they're used to be taken care of with white gloves at the, at the hair salon. They're used to be with white gloves at the car dealership. When they go to hotels, they always get the best suites. You know, so they're used to that service, service, service. So if you don't give it to them, they're not going to give you much respect back. Um, to get into the higher-end clientele, uh, you know, because they, they let me tell you what, they hang out with each other, they, just like everybody has networking. Mm -hmm. High end clients all network with high end clients. They all have the same high end friends. They got the same high end country club. They go to the same high end theaters and all that stuff. They all hang out with each other. So if you impress one of them, they'll start talking about you. And one of the funniest stories I tell people when I'm in a, a class is that I have two clients. Uh, the clients. Uh, and I, did, I knew both clients, but I didn't know that they knew each other. And they're many miles apart and many years apart. So when I go when I go do the Klaus's job, uh, I install their floor back in the 90s. They call me back in 2014 to do a refinish because it's 15 years old now. They want us to go ahead and redo it. Okay. So I refinish their house, right? During those 15 years, 
I met Christine Schultz, 60 miles north, who had a problem with a floor company she hired. It wasn't getting their color right. Uh, I show up, they didn't know how to do a bleach white floor. So I showed her we could do it. We get the job, we do our job. So then now comes the refinish of the closet's floor. I get onto the job site towards the end of the job and uh, Ingrid comes to me and says, oh, by the way, I had lunch with a friend of yours. I go, what, what friend? She goes, says, Christine Schultz. I said, oh my God, how do you know her? She goes, we went to high school together and we were having lunch the other day. When she heard I was redoing my floors, she was very adamant that I had to use her floor guy. <laughs> and I said to her, this is the two girls talking. I said to her, but I have a floor guy. He's been with me all these years. No, 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 no. you got to use my guy. And apparently that banter went back and forth a few sentences until they finally both realized they're talking about the same guy. <laughs> and then they both cracked up. Then they both cracked up. And I thought that was funny as hell, right? But that's what you want is a floor guy. You want people so enamored about your service and your company that they'll talk about you with that kind of passion. That's the win right there. Yeah. And especially with high-end clients. That's the win right there. Definitely. You know, you're, you're trying to build that name where you stay top of mind. You're not... You're not just the floor guy. You are you are Lenny the floor guy, and and you're great at what you do. That they want to talk about you. You know, you didn't just have somebody do your project. They're they're talking about you years later after you've completed stuff. Yep. So, all right. Um, at the very beginning, you you made a point that you. Um, I don't know. I, I think anyone that I've talked to that's been successful is, is giving back. <clears throat> And you didn't do oh, yeah. the you didn't do it to get the notoriety. You you were passionate about the industry and you wanted to participate in it. So how do we how does that all play a role in this? Um, I think it's a byproduct. Uh, once you once you get into doing higher end stuff, you're almost you're almost want to share that with other people so that they get into that same level of work uh, if not within your own area at least you give it back to somebody else who could have the opportunity to earn the next 20 or 30 years of, of career income with that knowledge um, I, I won my first floor of the year in 1997 uh, when I didn't even know there was a floor of the year contest the year before I did this project and the sales guy from a local distributor came by my office but I wasn't there I was actually on that project working it the office sent him to the job site and when the guy walked in he goes oh my god you got to submit this for floor of the year well he told me about it he told me actually about it nwfa which i knew of but i didn't know the breadth and depth mm -hmm. of what it was in 96 it only started in 85 and remember i started in 84 and i'm way down in the southern tip of florida they're in the middle of the states yeah um so i go and i submit and i win and that night i won um, you know, everybody's congratulating me, the normal stuff that happens when you win an award. But then two people that really changed my career path as far as education came up to me. Wayne Lee and Daniel Boone. These two came up to me and they said, where did you learn how to do this stuff? And can you teach it to other people? And we need you to be a teacher at an NWFA school. And I'm like, okay, I didn't even know there were schools. I uh, taught myself. And uh, sure, how do I start? <laughs> you know, because because that's the thing everybody's asking how i did this design thing in 96 and and it was just you know i kept telling the same story and over again so i would teach that at the classes that they had back in 90 uh eight seven i taught all the way through to 2005 took a couple years off and then got back into it 2013 okay. uh, started teaching again so but yeah, give it back. I mean, why, why? first off, none of my children want to do what I do. I always told them, find whatever you love to do, be excellent at it, and follow that as a career path. You'll always be happy. You'll never work a day in your life, and you'll get paid well for it. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they're all all four kids are doing that very thing, and it has nothing to do with wood floors. So, so I've got to give away my knowledge to everybody I can because if uh, if I pop off tomorrow, it's gone. You know, and this is one thing you can't take back is what you teach somebody. Uh, you know, and it's so important because you, you hear a lot, at least, you know, my perception growing up and and not being involved in the trades is that you would start out and people were the, the, the old guys would be grumpy and not want to teach you anything because you're going to go out on your own and you're not worth my time and I'm going to keep my secrets to myself. And I, I think that perception is still there. 
And really what I have found since I've been involved with the flooring industry is, is most guys are really happy to give it away. You just have to ask. Because yeah. If you keep it to yourself, you, who who are you doing a favor? You know? Yeah, nobody. Nobody. So I, I know I know this to be uh, I know this to be a a anecdotal truth is that if you teach your guys and you know that they can leave at any moment, here's what you want to know for sure: that if they leave you to go either go start on their own or to work for another company, that you don't want to have that other company or these other people that they're going to be working for see how bad they are and knew that they came from you. <laughs> yeah, because they're gonna. They're going to associate, oh, man, this guy, John Smith, did a shitty job. For, excuse me, I can't say that. John Smith did a really bad job in my house, and he used to work for ABC Floor Company, and I'm definitely not going to use them if they used to work there, too. No, you don't want that. <laughs> you want to make sure that they're doing everything they can to be the best that they can be. And you know what? If they have the energy and desire to be on their own, more power to them. I've never left the door closed that guys have left. Because you never know when you could use the help or when they might need to come back and you could use the help. So, yeah, yeah leave your doors wide open, you know, open arms and, and teach them everything you can. And if they go out on their own, more power to them. You know, let, let them do that, but let them at least be a copy of you, not something lesser than you are. So you're not going to get any you know, blowback from it. I, you know, I, yeah, totally. Because you don't want, like you said, you don't want them to go to that company and then they think you're a hack. Um, yep. you don't want them doing subpar work for that company either. Uh, my, my take on it has always been, uh, everyone's always complaining about the hacks in the industry and how they're not, and they're doing subpar work. So why would not you want to train somebody that can go out on their own and do just as good a work as you, if not better and, and raise the bar in your area? That's not, that's going to help yep. everybody. You want to bring up the prices because oh, yeah. you're, you're, you're getting paid 1970, 1980s wages. Well, let's get everybody <laughs> doing yeah. better work, you know, whatever they're going to complain about. And then, um, you, you bring up that, uh, now I forget. I lost my train of thought. Um, it's what if what if you train them what if you don't train them and they stay you know there's there's always that analogy oh, yeah, too yeah right? i've always heard that one too <laughs> right like it, yeah. we we can we can what if we train them and they leave and and what if we don't train them and they stay it invest yeah it, you, th that's that's my thing yeah. is just get it out there let's make everybody the best they can be whether they want to stick with you or not if they move on from flooring so be it and uh yeah, at least I at that time they were great I I've had well north over well north of 200 guys that have worked for me over the decades uh, come and go for whatever reasons to come and let go for whatever reasons. Uh, but I've never I've never really uh, felt awful about the fact that I've never tried my best to train them to be the best that they could possibly be. Most guys don't really want to do that because it's a lot of work. And you recognize that when you do the training, how little enthusiasm they may have for it mm -hmm. uh at least initially and sometimes after months and months and months and months they'll finally catch on and like oh yeah now i get it and then they're they're way well worth their weight in gold uh but other guys if you keep training them and training them and, training them and they can't get it it just tells you straight up this is not the guy for a floor guy i mean it takes a special person to want to be a floor guy you, nobody nobody goes to kindergarten stands up in front of their class <laughs> and say i want to be a policeman i want to be a fireman i want to be a floor man that doesn't happen so I can I can only think of one little girl that did that. <laughs> uh, is she really? Uh, well, no. I just actually got done talking with um, Joe and Hannah Dawson a couple weeks oh, ago, yeah. and so Han Hannah's, Hannah's, Hannah's PR, probably yeah, the she, only little girl that would ever stand up and say, "I want to be a floor oh, yeah, person." No, she would have. Yeah, I met Hannah a couple years ago. She's a sweetheart. <laughs> She's funny as hell. She's going to be around a while. Yeah. <laughs> But no, you're right. Uh, you know, you bring up a really good point is that you've invested well in over 200 guys in, in your, your years doing this. And you see all the time, I don't want to train anymore. I'm sick of it. Everybody leaves. Everybody leaves. I, yeah. You can't find a good guy. And you like you said, your your longest guy has been with you like 17 years. The next guy you said was like 11 or 12, which is a long time. And that's great. But most people have been with you five years or less. And you're still running a top notch company. So. 
what do guys need to take away to be able to do something like that and just like well we, we still trip on, we still we still trip over our shoelaces now and again no we're not always perfect that's the thing you you strive to want to be perfect but we're always you know stumbling here and stumbling there it's just how fast we can pick ourselves up and keep going uh one of the one of the common themes I, I reiterate to my guys and at schools is that it's okay to make the mistake. It's not okay to leave the mistake. Mm -hmm. That's the problem is a lot of guys will make mistakes. First off, may, may not be trained enough to know that they've left the mistake and they keep on going. Uh, if they are trained enough to know that they left the mistake and they still left it, then you have to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the guy and say, look, there's only two possibilities as to why, uh, that cracked board stayed in the floor. One, you didn't see it to be able to change it out, which is on me because I didn't train you all well enough to be alert to look at those things before you left the job site. Or two, you saw that board and you decided you didn't care enough to change it, which is not good on you. So whichever the two it is, it's got to be fixed one of two ways. You're either going to comply to make sure that the owner doesn't have to deal with a callback on a floor or two, you're going to find another career path because it's not going to be here. And it's straight up. I mean, no, no soft, uh, no soft selling on this one. You tell them straight up. It's either this or that. There's no gray area. And these conversations have happened where I've talked to guys who have, uh, you know, it, tape on the bottom of the threshold after Hold on. I, I'm, I, hold, I lost you a little bit. I'm sorry. They left the blue tape behind, and then I go out there. Uh, so, right. okay. uh, uh, so tell, you, me, tell you, me where you lost me. Um, bef right before the tape on the threshold. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. I'm okay. Here. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, uh, just right before you were you were talking about you you've dealt with problems and and they left like tape on the like, threshold or whatever that was. Yeah, so so you you know if the crew needs some support after the fact, uh, in the case of tape tape being left at the bottom of the threshold, if they're coating a floor and they have tape there, if they can't pull the tape off, at least they need to be smart enough to tell me that they need to do it the next day, or at least I'll do it the next day for them so they can carry on. But I've had instances where I didn't get a call for two or three days, and then the owner says, hey, man, you guys going to take the blue tape off? I'm like, what? Why is this still there? Yeah. And I go back to it. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I say, Luis, you can't forget this stuff, man. This is what we don't want the client to experience. We want to make sure we're on top of it. So, look, they're like having children. Everybody knows it. You hire an employee, it's like a grown-up child, and you have to keep nurturing them and nurturing them. And, yeah, they're not going to always be perfect. Yeah, they're going to stumble here and there. As long as it's not horrendous and you can keep working with them, uh, you know they're they're valuable. If they're definitely not going to participate in the program, then you got to just cut your losses now and get on to the next guy and just keep going, guy after guy after guy after guy until you get the one you want to keep, and then you do everything you can to nurture them to be the best they can be. But why why deal with it? Why why did you choose to deal with it over and over and over again and go through all of the guys that are failures I, not that they're failures that, that's not a, that's a bad way to put it but like they they failed yeah. at being able to onboard onto your onto your company and your system and your your dream and vision and you have to go through over and over and over again why you know there's so many guys that go through a couple of apprentices and they just say you know what i'm done i'm gonna do it by myself and that's the way i'm gonna run this for 40 yeah. years you, you had a bigger dream. You you wanted to have crews out there. You wanted to be able to do something. So why deal with it? Well, I actually came from, like, when I got the company in 1984, we had over 25 employees. And I built it up to over 45 employees. And then I realized I was just pushing a rock up a hill that wasn't going to get any higher uh, because I wasn't getting any better people. And I was getting more and more of the jobs I really didn't want, the lower end category jobs. Mm -hmm. So I started peering the so I started peering the company down and so I found the comfortable size of 10 employees uh, to do the type of work we do which is like I said the bread and butter work and then we get a really nice assortment of high end work that these guys can handle. And frankly if I was by myself I wouldn't be able to do all this work by myself. So I have to have people to help me. You got to multiply yourself in order to get this work done. And, and have the variability of having two guys, three guys, or four guys on any given job at any time. 
uh, you have to have people. And that, that's the cho- choice I made. I, I know guys have had one or two apprentices that have just had no good experience trying to expand their company out of just doing the everyday drumming and polishing and sanding that they do all the time. But you got to keep suffering before you find that one guy or one set of guys that is going to be basically impersonating you on a job site. They're going to be doing work like you. They're going to be acting like you, talking like you. And that's what you that's what you hope for. And fortunately for me, I've got 10 guys and myself that are out there doing this work. And, you know, the 10 guys, uh, the bottom four or five are fluctuating. Uh, we might go down to eight for a while and then try to pick up two more guys. And we just keep going through, going through, going through until we find a uh, chemistry that will work. And then through no, no fault of my own, Sometimes these guys decide to do something else, even after the fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, one guy, one guy went to Jacksonville, wanted to be a truck driver after a year and a half with me. Another guy moved over to Tampa, Florida, because his sister was ill, and then he had to stay over there. So things happen. You just got to go through life. Yeah. But I found that um, having a good core group of guys and then just uh, sticking with them will help you multiply your your business and not have to have you work sixty. Like I don't work sixty hours a week. I work maybe 40, 45 hours a week, and we do a tremendous amount of work in those few hours. Yeah, but there—I mean, I'm sure in the beginning there were there were 80, 90 hour weeks. Oh, back when I had the forty-five guys, yeah, I had that. Uh, a wife with two new kids, and the wife telling me that if I don't find time to get home, I'm going to come home to an empty house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure yeah. a lot of guys have heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, because I thought, I thought, you know, being the biggest, the baddest, the best was the thing to do. And I found out, like I said, it was like pushing a rock up a hill. You eventually can only get so high, and then you can just push all hard you want. You're not going to get any better. And that's what I found. I found there's too many loose ends, too many things going awry. And it was really starting to tarnish our reputation in town. And, and again, that's the one thing you don't want to have damaged. So I started paring it down right before 2008. Uh, I cut it down to about 30, 35 guys. And when the crash happened, it just accelerated that uh, plan to like a two month plan. I went right down to 12 people, 10 people, eight people, six people, and uh, and just kept it going until the economy turned around, which it will. And mm-hmm. this, this is the thing we're going for right now. It's going to come back hard. So if you can, keep your people, keep your people going, and keep looking for good people. They're, they're out there. You just got to keep weeding through them all. Well, so last question. We, we are a lot of people don't know the generation breakdown. We are through dealing with millennials. They are they are 25 and older. Gen Z is 25 and, and younger. Can we find not that we're through dealing with millennials? We can still hire them. Uh, yeah. But the, can you find a good kid that's 25 or younger that will actually work hard and stay off his phone? I mean, are you finding good Gen Z guys and gals to come and work for you? Uh, Not really. It doesn't mean that they won't be up. No, no. The seriousness is that that whole generation is just uh, never learned to work hard. They never had to work hard. They came from a set of parents that they gave everything to them, for them, by them, and does everything. Uh, doesn't let them live on their own. Mm-hmm. So they're not self. They're not self dependent, and then they're not independent. So they, uh, that's one thing I've found. And a lot of the newer guys that come with that age bracket, I find, don't last very long. They find out they actually have to work hard because uh, this is hard work. There's no way around it. You got to either love to get dirty, dusty, and smelly, or you're not going to love this at all. There's yeah. no gray area. But, so, uh, but you know, if they, if they are out there, because I know that a lot of younger guys on social media that are out there in that same age group category, they're out there working, uh, but they're definitely few and far between. So you got to kind of just go through them all. Just go through them all, go through them all. You'll know in the first hour. If they're definitely not worth it, you'll know in the first couple of days, once the polish comes off and it gets tarnished, if they're going to be good, you'll know after mm-hmm. a couple of weeks, if they're really going to be a keeper or not. So you just keep working through the guys until you can. So do you not currently have anyone under the age of 25 employed by you? That's correct. The youngest guy I have, I believe is Julian and no, it's Gerardo and he's 31. Okay. Man, that's yeah, rough, Julian. dude. That's not what I want to hear. Um, not that we can't change it. I, I, and you're right; they're out there. They they truly they are out there. You you've got to find them. But is it any different? Do you notice a difference between when you were hiring like Gen Xers to Millennials to now Gen Z? Has has the pool gotten worse? Yeah, um, I think the pool you're going to find if you want to even go to the 
ethnic classifications that you're going to find that the American kids, they don't want to work. You're going to find that the immigrant kids are coming from a family background that knew they had to work for everything that they earned. Mm -hmm. And so they're the harder working class of guys that you're going to have in, in that age category. My, my take, my personal take on it, maybe uh, same in every region, but down here, yeah, I'm going to be probably looking at getting like, like Gerardo, he's 31, but he comes from a Hispanic background. He doesn't have a whole lot. So he's working like a mule. The kid's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and there will be younger generation, younger kids of that same ilk that are going to come here. They came from, you know, real impoverished towns in their South American countries to come here to go chase the American dream. And they want to work. And it's been like that all these years that I've done work for that. I find that the American uh, kids don't seem to have that same hunger to want to work hard is a lot of the immigrant kids, which is a shame, too, because, dude, this thing has done great for me and it can do great for everybody. I I agree. Um, you know, the the American kids used to pick the strawberry fields or whatever, you know, whatever they were doing to, to make a buck during the summer. Or they were doing hay. Or, oh, yeah. And, and now I they don't want to do it. Everyone complains they took our jobs. They took our jobs. No, you don't want to do no. that job. They didn't take yeah, it. You, you gave you it gave up. <laughs> Gave it up, exactly right. I used to I used to do that as a kid. I was 14 years old working with my friend's uh, family's farm baling hay in the summer. So it was, uh, you know, working hard. That's mm -hmm. it. Oh, so many insights, Lenny. I, I very much appreciate all of them. Um, how can, if anyone has questions, how can they, how can they find you? Anything you want to kind of promote real quick? Uh, well, I can tell you that uh, I'm not a closed door not only just in my own company, but to the world, you can find me on uh, Facebook under Len Leonard Hall, my full name, Leonard A. Hall. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Endurance Floor Co. It's all combined one word. Uh, you can call me on my cell phone. I'm glad to give that out at 305-796-2885. And uh, you can email me at Endurance Floor Company. Sorry, I forgot my own email. Enduranceflor at gmail.com. <laughs> okay. Oh, gosh. Yeah, awesome. So that's the problem with being older. You forget how to speak every now and again. And, and I appreciate your time uh, letting me speak. Uh, I, I just have so much to, to, to give back to this industry. I can't find avenues enough to do it. No, I, my pleasure's all mine. Thank you for taking time out of out of your day to uh, join us and give us the insights that you've garnered over the years and share them. Um, I'm sure many, many people will find this helpful and how to change directions or get redirected and uh, focus in and, and grow their businesses. So I, I got to encourage everybody to to learn while they earn um stop stop yeah. doing the music that's that's the big thing stop doing music and and find a way to educate yourself and then uh lenny thank you again and i i enjoyed it and i hope to do it again super you're more than welcome have a great day you too bye that's all the time we have for this week to keep the conversation going head on over to the floor academy facebook group be sure to subscribe so you can hear each and every episode. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and most major podcast directories. Don't forget to leave a review and let us know what you think about the show. If you would like to be a guest, have questions or feedback, you can email us at flooracademypodcast at gmail.com. You can help support the show by becoming a patron over at www.patreon.com slash Remember to learn while you earn.